Our day is divided into two separate components. First, we'll hear from Dr. Ali Alawa, author of Israeli Palestinian Conflict on Al Halam al Sharif, highest Palestinian women supporting the religious and political role of Al Halam al Sharif, on his findings and recommendations for the issues at hand. Dr. Awa holds a PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in Middle East Studies and Islam and is known across the region for his expertise. Afterwards, we'll host a panel of speakers representing a number of positions over parallel and often overlapping issues from the egalitarian prayer at the Western Wall to the question of Jewish prayer uh, at the Holiest of Holies to the centrality of the, the city to the Christian doctrine as well. So let us first begin with Dr. Awar. Uh, first of all, Ramadan Karim. Certainly, thank you. And we'll start with a brief presentation before we start with the Q&A. Uh, I'll just open your... your yeah. Places 
of adults. The Yan announced that the Jewish would be allowed, okay, no problem, the Jewish would be allowed to visit the Tindy Mount, the Haram Sharif, the Aqsa Mosque, but not the whole religion set there. So that's very important from uh, Minister of Defense, Moshe Dayan, and 67. that all the agreement between Jordan and Israel from 67 that there was there were agreement that the Jordan control inside the Haram and security control outside of the Haram for uh, Israel. Uh, we can see it's okay 2000 Sharon who was uh, the leader of the good party, the Yamin uh, Israeli. Okay. When he visited the Haram Sharif, Sharon life changed the status That all the Jewish entered the Haram Sharif by the what? By the what administration, which related to Jordan. But Sharon, like from his visiting to change status quo in September 2000. But we can see what happened after Sharon visiting to Haram Sharif. When he go to change status quo, <coughs> sorry, we see the second intifada, which called Intifada al Aqsa, started. And we can see more blood from Palestinian and more blood from Jewish. Why? Because visiting of Sharon, he likes to change the scope. We can see Gideon Levy and Haaretz, he gave the number for the Jewish and Palestinian who killed and the second and the father. We can see. One thousand thirty-eight Jewish girls in the Muslim Aqsa, three thousand one eight nine Palestinian killed. Why? More die. More. It's in Haram Sharif to change Haram Sharif. Palestinian, I think, and all the world Muslim did not agree or allow to change such score for uh, the Jewish. Okay, so all the visits of the Jewish groups, we can start from you, you, you the clip to Benjamin or uh, we can see uh, Sharon or the others or member uh, Knesset or uh, ministers from Israel government. All their business, we can see that in order to give the conflict religious nature, that all visiting that and to change the conflict from national uh, conflict to religious conflict. That very important and they have to achieve political and electoral objectives. And we can see you that left many times visit the Haram Sharif and he became uh, a member of Knesset uh, and a Likud party. Okay, so I say that Al Aqsa is in danger. Al Aqsa is in danger because the Israel government allowed the Jewish group to enter the Haram Sharif every day and they like change the status quo and Haram Sharif. You can we can see it together. That's one of uh, this thing of Yuga Lake and his friends more and more times to visit. You can see also Jewish groups when uh, the police uh, uh, keep uh, uh, them. Oh, we can see.
saying that uh, Ronald Kurjma is uh, the leader of uh, Israel Police in Jerusalem, allowed last uh, week to be the leader of the Arab Sharif, and I think he must back to the history, and he see that the blood from uh, the Sharon's visiting to Haram al-Sharif before 22 years. And I hope to stop. All the stuff is in danger. Also, we have the uh, uh, Islamic movement in Israel, which led by Sheikh Salah. Also, he supported the Murabiti and the Murabita to come uh, to Elam Kamos and uh, uh, prevent the Jewish groups, to stop the Jewish groups to enter Al Haram uh, Shem. Yeah. Why found uh, uh, the uh, Murabitat? Uh, we can we can back to 2015 uh, and we can see that Israel uh, did not allow to the men to enter Al Haram Sharif. So uh, Mufti Sheikh Akram uh, Sabri and Sheikh Rahat Salah decided to, uh, uh, to establish that al murabitat movement, al murabitat that related to women, Palestinian women, Muslim women, to uh, stop the Jewish groups to enter the Haram al-Sharif. And we can see this is number of murabitat. And if you can see, they said, we are related to Muslim Brothers Hood. You can see that the symbol of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Rabbi al alawiyya You remember the time of Sisi, uh, uh, and the Muslim now said we are related to Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, you can see that one of my interviews of or, uh, with the Murabitar, they uh, uh, said, uh, we, we are afraid to the Jewish groups. They aim to divide the Haram Sharif. Why are sites in danger? Because the Muslim, the Palestinian, afraid that the Jewish group going to divide Haram Sharif between Jewish and Muslim and to destroy Al Aqsa. The Murabita said, We refuse all types of visits. We refuse all types of visits by Jewish to the Haram Sharif. We will not allow to Jewish to pray in the side because we are afraid that their activities for Jewish groups will lead to changing the status quo and destruction of the Samos and the Dome of the Okay. And Elizabeth. The Muratat and the Muslim and the Palestinian said no way to divide that almost between Jewish and uh, Muslim. <coughs> yeah. Netanyahu. Yeah, we remember Netanyahu. Netanyahu says no, will not change. And Kiri, understanding Amman with his meeting with King Abdullah the second, he said that storm will not change in Haram Sharif. But Netanyahu's policy on the ground aims to change the status quo. You can see. Netanyahu likes to put uh, electrical doors, cameras on the gates of uh, Aqsa Mosque. That means Netanyahu would like to change the status quo. <clears throat> yeah. Palestinians refused, rejected all their actions from Israel government, from Netanyahu. And we can see they praying outside of the Haram Sharif that in 2017. And we remember in the father Babel Asfar, which called in the father Babel Asfar, that's the Muslim Palestinian rejected all the Israel government uh, actions uh, to change the status quo. Yeah. 
<coughs> yeah, that gave the understanding 2016, and the violence continued in 2017. We can see Palestinians refused any actions to change that situation before 14 July 2017, and the Israeli government removed. You can see Israel government removed the weapon reports uh, and security counts. And the Palestinians back to Harb Sharif, and Israel government removed all their uh, new uh, uh, actions or the uh, security camera, uh, camera from the gates of the Hajj. Yeah. Now, now we are in the holy month for the Muslims, Ramadan month. And we can see it started before five days. And we can see every day in the evening there was flash between Palestinian and the Israeli police. Why? This is the, the site, Bab al Amun, the Damascus Gate. That's very important for the Palestinian, for the Muslim, that gives the national identity, the cultural identity for the Palestinian. The Damascus Gate is the center of the clashes between Palestinian and Israeli police. The Damascus Gate represents Palestinian and Islamic identity and culture. Yeah. If maybe someone asked me why, why the Damascus Gate is very important for the Muslim. It's not the, the holy site, it's the entrance for the uh, old city. Yeah, but we can see this is a popular place. Babel Amur, we can see the symbol of Palestinian art and culture. We can see popular Dabke, music, and the meeting the Palestinian and the joy smoke their gear and many uh, cultural activities uh, uh, in uh, Damascus Day after the uh, Palestinian finish uh, 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 trying uh, uh, which called uh, uh, Tarawih. We can see the presence of thousands of people armed, many armed, many Israel armed, many Israel police and Damascus Gate. Why? This is Damascus Gate will stand that the meeting, the popular place, the culture place, more activities, fun, art, music for the Palestinian. And I think if we need peace in these days, in Ramadan month, I think that the main important action for the Israel police and the Israel government, the, the police station at the Damascus Gate must be removed. I am Jerusalem. I live in Jerusalem. I live, I, live, I live in all city. And I see it every day, how the clash between the Palestinian and Israel police. So I think that the police station at the Damascus Gate must be removed and you can write about it. Yeah, I did not uh, uh, back to the uh, Israel law. Uh, Israel can say no, but the main important thing is that the United Nations Security Council Resolution 478 that did not recognize for the Israel law which declared that uh, Israel uh, uh, complete and unity capital for Israel. The United Nations Security Council did not recognize for Israeli Knesset or Jerusalem. Yeah. The last part in my lecture that is very important for you. Yeah, Laksa Mosque, a second place for Muslim. Yeah, we know. But also 
has become a symbol of national identity for Palestine. Al Harb Sharif is not only the religious place, the holy site for the Muslim, it also became a symbol of national identity for Palestine. And I think that's very important. Al Aqsa Mosque, Al Harb Sharif, is the third most important three holy sites for the Muslim. But after the Israel occupation, after Israel occupation Jerusalem, Jerusalem became, Al Harb Sharif became a symbol of national identity for Palestinians. By recommendation in this picture, you can see Al Aqsa Mosque. 144 dollars has been owned by Muslims and Palestinians for about 1,400. 1,400 has been owned by Muslims and Palestinians. And the change to this legal status will lead to increase mostly and violence between Palestinians and Israelis. Who want or who like to change status quo? That means more violence between Palestinian and Jewish. The Israeli government must, uh, must put an end to the bills of supporting the civil organizations that seek to make the conflict religious. Jewish groups, Yudaglek, Bengavir, others like to change to the conflict from national conflict, we can solve it by political, by negotiation, but they like to change the conflict to religious conflict, which makes it difficult to achieve a political solution. Continued coordination, yeah, continued coordination between the world and Israel government to ban the Status quo before 2000, before Sharon visiting, Jewish will be allowed to enter the Haram Sharif only as a tourist. Only as a tourist, they may not worship there. I think the Jewish can worship them uh, in the Western world, but in the Haram Sharif, the Jewish allowed to visit the Haram Sharif as a tourist. They may not worship there, reduce the number of Israel. I, I say this is my recommendation to, uh, to bring peace. No clash, no more blood between the Syrian and Jewish. Reduce the number of Israeli police, officers, and Laksa Mosque. Stop the aggression against the Murabitar at Laksa Mosque. You know, you know, in our tradition, Arabian and Muslim, what that mean when the soldier or the police kick, sorry, the woman or punch, push that woman, the Muramita, that it's not good for our tradition. Stop the aggression against the Muramita at Laksa at the gates of the Haram Sharif in Islamic and Arab culture, violence against women is a violation of victory that derives young people, drives young people to violence. Yeah, we finish now, one minute. Remove the Israeli police force at the domestic states. Again, I write this is in my recommendation, and that's very important for the Israeli police, the Israeli government, to everyone who looking for the peace, not flash between Palestinian and Jewish, remove the Israeli police force at the Damascus gate because it led to clash with Palestinian. Yeah, return to political, yeah, return to political negotiations between the state of Israel and the Palestinian Authority, headed by President Mahmoud Abbas Abu Mazen. And I trust with Abu Mazen. I trust with him. He is peace leader. He liked to make peace with the Israeli government. President Mahmoud Abbas, which will lead to a two-state solution. The state of Palestine with East Jerusalem as its capital, along 
with the state of Israel and in the opposition. Finally, all United Nations resolutions defined in Jerusalem as an occupied territory and that Israel must maintain the culture, religious, and demographic situation in Jerusalem. So that means no change to status quo in Jerusalem and Hashem. Thank you so much for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Carlos Reyes. I'm a journalist of different the outlets from Latin America and Spain, in Spanish. Allow me first of all to wish you Ramadan Karim. Thank you. I have several Muslim friends, and that's a very big blessing. But on the other hand, I must say that I'm really annoyed by this presentation. I am neither a right winger nor a religious Jew. But the presentation is a real distortion, I think, not only of history and, and present situation, of course, not distortion of, of the violence that see, but I think that the main problem is that Muslims nowadays, in the last tens of years, it wasn't a situation like that, you know, several centuries ago, to not recognize the link between the Jewish people and Jerusalem. You stress that the Haram Sharif is the third the most important mosque in Islam. Well, the Temple Mount in the Jewish terminology is the first most sacred place for Jews. And when the Jews, I know that in the groups that in the last uh, years have been coming in larger numbers, go to the Mount, there are people among them who try to, to, to pray, we know that, but that's not the characteristic of those groups. They never try to enter Haram Sharif. Uh, Sharon, which, whom I didn't like at all, didn't enter Haram Sharif, the mosque itself as well. He went to the mount, of course. But I mean, the main problem, I think, and as I told you, I, I never voted for the right. I'm not a religious person. I'm not interested in praying anywhere. But uh, I think the main problem is that Islam does not Islam, at least the Palestinian Islam, yeah. I say, does not recognize the historic and very millennial, really, link of the Jewish people with the Temple Mount. And that, that's the problem. You think it's, you know, you are not, I don't mean personally, of course, sir. Uh, think that, you know, Jews only want to make trouble there and to change the status quo, to destroy al -Aqsa, which I think would be a tragedy. But you, uh, you cannot conceive the possibility that, that they go there because they think it's a sacred place for them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I will back to the history. During the Empire of Man, Turkish Empire of Man allowed the Jewish to pray in the Western world. And if I take you more to the history, you remember that the Jewish the Romans destroyed all the history of the Jewish, with Amikdash or the others. And you remember, I think you read the history very well, that the Khalifa Amr al-Khattab, he allowed the Jewish to back the city. This is the first. Second, also, in the period of Salah al-Din, the Salibi, Salib, that did not allow the Jewish to stay in the old city. But when Salah al-Din liberated Jerusalem, he allowed to the Jewish to the birth. So now you can see, I take it from Halakha, from Abad Yusuf, that he said, no one can know where is the location of Beit HaMikdash. No one can know. Also, I didn't know. But you, you know, and I present now that the Palestinian recognized for the history of Jewish, but they did not, not recognize, sorry, they did not recognize that David Abidash and Haram Sharif. This is from Obada Yusuf, Rabbi Obada Yusuf. This is Halakha on Wednesday, that's the number 5775, Rabbi Obada Yusuf, that he said, we cannot be exactly sure where on the same mount the metal that that is stood. No one knows about the use. This is not me and not the city. So 
in short. That's something else. Sorry. We can answer Sorry. that right now. Sir, in short, I uh, approve this group. Uh, the Jewish now praying in the Western world and the Palestinian. The Muslim, the Haram Sharif, 144 dollars, it's all by Muslim and Palestinian. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for being here again, Dr. al and Ramadan Karim. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> um, so, I'm going to ask your patience because there's a few things I want to talk about. First of all, you mentioned uh, the great Omar al Khattab in 638, who invited the Jews back into the city and basically gave them the Western Wall. Under the Byzantine Christians, of course, the closest they could come was Mount of Olives, right? This is a wonderful. Uh, display of tolerance. Salahuddin also, because Jews were absolutely forbidden from the city by the Crusaders, invited them back into the city. This is a terrific tradition, which I have to say the Palestinian leadership seems to have forgotten about. All right? Uh, there has been an attempt, particularly in the last 25 years, and I understand this is largely a reaction to the Temple Mount Faithful, the Temple Institute, and people sympathetic to them, to de-Judaize the Temple Mount, okay, to remove its historical connections. Famously, uh, German Arafat said in, I think it was, I can't remember what year, but uh, said one of the most unbelievable contradictions of history ever, I'm not sure there ever was a Jewish temple in Temple Mount. I maybe heard about some temple in Nablus. This, of course, is crazy. The great archaeologist Gami Barkai produced about 10 years ago a English language tourist pamphlet from the 1930s issued by the Wokak itself that stated very clearly that the connection between Solomon's temple and the Haram al-Sharif is undeniable, okay? And now we've seen for about 20 years an attempt to, to claim that they have been done. The rabbi Ovadi Yosef, which is a Sephardic rabbi, of course, a chief rabbi in Judaism is not like a folk in Catholicism. He makes a statement, and it's misinterpreted very much, and I think you've misinterpreted here. I don't know whether intentionally or not. Okay, When he's talking about where we don't know exactly where the temple was, he's speaking specifically about the temple. He, says, he uses Beit HaMikdash quite specifically, rather than Temple Mount. Okay, because this is, about, this is not about an issue about whether it was ever there or where it's the correct location. This is about where the temple precincts were, and which, whether non-Jews can go to it, and for Jews, what Jews can go to what part. And of course, in our tradition, only the high priest could enter the Kadosh HaKadoshim on Yom Kippur only. All right, so to, to, there's, this has been something that has come up over and over again over the last 20 years, that he was suggesting that we don't really know where it was because of this awkward statement. It's a misrepresentation of what okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, uh, I like again that no one can know where is Kochi Puchi. This is the first point. The second, if we know the Kochi Puchi that uh, in the Torah uh, says, Abakato uh, Tahur. Abakato Tahur as a film, Shatala Makir said that when I get in the Western world, as a Tarah Hola, I get a Kochi Puchi. Then we are Torah, we are a Sebra Kadosh. As uh, we back to understand. So I think that now we are have conflict and we can we can solve this conflict by negotiation and I think we we, we can uh, make a good agreement uh, in Jerusalem but the Jewish have to know that no one can change the storm. The Haram Sharif uh, is only for Muslims and the Jewish can visit the Haram Sharif uh, as the other non-Muslim who, uh, who come from China, Japan, Greece, uh, uh, Roma and the other countries, the Jewish can allow to them can visit the Haram Sharif as a tourist. But no brain, no one can, no one can allow or agree to the Jewish to make bringing or the body of Haram Shir. And we remember that in the second pandemic, Mr. Clinton asked me that Arafat, Abu Ammar, Abu Ammar, where is Beta Mikdash? Arafat said, I don't know, maybe in Yemen, maybe in Spain, if you remember that uh, 
uh, statement uh, for a fact. So uh, I uh, promise you, uh, no one from the million Muslims allowed or agree uh, that you wish to play in the Okay, I'm just gonna beg your patience a little bit more. First of all, I wanna say that on a personal level, okay, I'm absolutely opposed to any idea about removing the Muslim holy places on the Temple Mount. I mean, the way, I'm, and I would ask I'm a Torian and I'm a historian, and it's my favorite place in the world. Short question. Do you see me one time, I am in the hotel and the Western world? Do you see any Palestinian coming and make noisy for the Jewish? Do you see well that, sorry, do you see uh, the Palestinian come to the hotel, to the Western world, and uh, make uh, brain? No. Haram Sharif is only for Muslim, the Western world, not you, the Western world, <laughs> for the Jewish. I, I'm sorry, Dr. al I'm I really, I, with all due respect, I have to tell you, yes, that Muslims are perfectly welcome to come to the Kota. Uh, and do, very often. And I, as a tour guide who, who takes a lot of Muslim <laughs> groups from other parts of the world, I bring them there quite often. Um, I also want to point out, because you brought up uh, in 2017, the imposition of the magnetrons at uh, Baba Aswad, Aspad, excuse me. Uh, that, that was in response to a shooting in which three police officers were killed, and that uh, then Prime Minister Netanyahu, at a great political cost to himself, defied his right-wing support and removed the metal detectors after two days. There's another thing from 2019 that you didn't mention at all, which is, of course, the Golden Gate, the Babur al-Khamin, where in defiance of the 1967 status quo, was uh, opened up and turned into a mosque, which, of course, historically it had never been. All right, so it's, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about breaking the status quo, the finish is on both sides. You can see general like Mashiach. General, like mm -hmm. he announced that we are now uh, coming to conquer the, uh, the holy places for the Arabs. And he said that the Haram Sharif for Muslims, the Western world for Jewish. Uh, and I met uh, Sheikh Akram Sofi, he told me that the meeting uh, uh, with uh, Moshe Dayan and three leaders of Islamic world, his father, the father of Sheikh Akram Sofi, and the Muhtasim and Tahu, that the three leaders, uh, Moshe Dayan, asked them, please give me the king of the Morocco game, that the three leaders gave to Moshe Dayan, the key of Morocco game, and he told them, you are free now, Haram Sharif, for you, for the Muslim, and the Muslim world. Thank you so much. We have, time, we have time for one more question. Um, so if, any, if anyone doesn't have one, then I have one from a journalist who was unable to make it uh, to the event. So perhaps one more question from the audience. Anybody? Okay. Um, I'll just add my own uh, interpretation to the question after hearing the whole, the whole, uh, the whole presentation. Um, what message are you giving your own communities, in particular the younger people, uh, when, when you're basically saying at the end of the day that um, that violence is justified, that violence is a tool with which to <coughs> execute policy. The Jews are, uh, whether this is true or not, are, um, are challenging the status quo, the, so the immediate reaction is violence. What message does that send? Yeah, I have two, I have two words for uh, answering this question. The first part, we can, uh, before 2000, before 70, and we can ask, how did you wish enter the Haram Sharif before 2000? We can see that the what administration allowed the Jewish and protect the Jewish and make safety for the Jewish to visit the Haram Sharif, all the area of the Haram Sharif. So, what now the Jewish groups? Enter by Morocco Gate. No, the Jewish groups can enter from any gate, from Al Aspar, from the Nexus, from the Garden, and this is one. So uh, I mean, we have to back to that situation. 
surface core before shell office. This is uh, a big uh, I would and I uh, send a message for the Jewish, for the Israeli people that more soldiers, more Israeli police in Jerusalem and in Haram Sharif in, and in the Masjid here that give and bring more clash between Palestinian and Jewish. So I think to reduce the number and to back to the table negotiation with our major, with our major the President Mahmoud uh, Abbas uh, to make agreement and I promise you we can make uh, agreement with Mahmoud uh, Abbas and Israel. Sir, the two points are very clear, but at the end of the day, I, I'm asking you again, when violence is justified, whether it's on the Israeli side or the Muslim side, you need to respond to that. At the end of the day, if you say, you know, the reasons are clear, why it's happening, you can, uh, you can, you can explain it away, but at the end of the day, if you say that doing X will cause Y, yeah. going up to Haram al-Sharif will cause violence. There, there's a logical yeah, issue in, there. In short, Israel police must stop their policy in Haram al-Sharif, in Sheikh Jarrah, in the Muslim here, and in the other places in Jerusalem, that means the Israel government has to know that no one can change the religion from the Palestinian people, the ideology from the Palestinian people. So I think, uh, again, uh, the Holy Site, the Haram Sharif, for the Muslim and Israel government stop to allow to the other, the Jewish people to enter Haram Sharif. Uh, and the greater Judeo-Christian world. I'll also add that we're in the middle of the National Diaspora Awareness Week, so that's particularly interesting for our conversation. Um, I'll briefly introduce our panelists before um, hearing from each, and then we'll open for questions. So, uh, sitting to my left is Yehuda Glik, a former member of Knesset on behalf of the Likud Party, and a member of the Movement for Jewish Rights on Jerusalem's Temple Mount. He was pre previously executive director of the Temple Institute and now heads the Shalom Jerusalem Foundation, as well as Amit Sim, an organization for young widows and orphans. Anat Hoffman, sorry? Yes, sorry. Anat Hoffman is the executive director of the Israel Religious Action Center. Uh, she's the founder of the Women's Rights Advocacy Organization, sorry. Women of the Wall, uh, and was a member of the Jerusalem City Council where she represented the Civil Rights and Peace Movement. And we have, obviously, at the end here, Dr. Petra Hent, uh, who is the Executive Secretary of the Ecumenical Theological Research Fraternity in Israel, a German native. She resides in Jerusalem. Uh, she's been here for more than 40 years. Uh, she's a lecturer in the Jerusalem Biblical Studies Society and previously mm -hmm. a professor for Jewish and Christian relations in the Middle East, in Middle East at the Jerusalem University College. So thank you all three of you for joining us today. Um, before each of you speaks, I've prepared kind of a guiding question for our conversation, if that's OK. Uh, and then, of course, we'll go into questions, as I said. Uh, so we'll begin with you, sir, if that's OK. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is an unusual panel. We actually have more women than men. So the uh, JPC's uh, Affirmative action, no, I'm kidding. Uh, there's an expression, it's better to be smart than right. In Hebrew, it's something we often hear from security officials, uh, meaning that their goal of preventing an escalation of violence is, is greater than their sympathy for uh, the Jewish yearning to pray at the Temple Mount. Um, how do you reconcile uh, between your responsibility, I guess, uh, as a former parliamentarian uh, for public safety, and your responsibility to see through your own ideology and personal beliefs? Well, it's uh, very often that could be a contradiction. But when it's not a contradiction, it's even better. It seems like very, very important for me human life, and uh, it's also important for me that Jerusalem should be a city of peace. And so what I do is make sure Jerusalem remains a place which is safe. I just came this morning, I was on the Temple Mount, and I had a prayer for peace. 
peace, we pray for peace in the world, we pray for peace in the region. And we saw Muslims praying and Jews praying. Thank God, tourists are back. We saw a group of 300 people from, from Indonesia. Some of them were Muslims, some of them were Christian. There was a group from Portugal, there was a group from Britain. There was a high school group from, from a, a non-religious school. Um, the most important thing, the best way to compete with terror, is not to get into terror. Uh, getting into terror is the most dangerous thing. You can escalate hate. And therefore, in order to prevent the loss of lives, I encourage people to go to the Temple Mount. Because uh, years ago, the place was a place where it was, it was a lot of radical, violent activity on Temple Mount. And the thing has changed ever since we encouraged more and more people to go to the Temple Mount. We managed to outlaw violence. And when I come to a classroom and I see there's a bully in the classroom, the worst thing to do is everybody to get bowed down. The best thing to do is to take the bully out of the classroom. And that, that, that's what brings peace. And so I'm for, or all for encouraging more and more people to go to the Temple Mount, the World Center for Peace, the World Center for Prayer, to keep away from there anybody who's there to promote incitement, hate, and harassment, and to encourage all people who believe in, in inclusiveness uh, to be, bring them there. I think that, 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 that's the secret. The secret is to, to respect people with different opinions. And the, the, the nicest concert to go to is when there's a violin and a drum and a cello and a piano. If you're only going to a place where they're playing only one, one instrument, and then there's no, there's no concert, there's no harmony. So the best way to promote harmony is by promoting harmony. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Ms. Hoffman, uh, the issue of egalitarian prayer in Jerusalem seems to be reserved, at least in terms of recognition of it, is, is in either Israeli or Jewish diaspora uh, discourse. It's not something that, I'm sorry, the, the issue of egalitarian prayer, egalitarian prayer in Jerusalem is something that is usually discussed only in, you know, in the in the in the Jewish or the Israeli discourse. It's not something that the rest of the world is really familiar with. Um, there are, there have been several compromises on the table uh, in the past, uh, and either have been rejected by uh, by ultra orthodox members of government or or even members of your own community. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit about what those uh, compromises are, what you believe should be the solution for what you're looking for to achieve? So look, first, let me explain what Women of the Wall want. We want four things, and they all begin with the letter T. And one of them is that this tallit, a prayer shawl, and uh, I will expertly show you what a prayer shawl looks like for women. Um, in some Israeli audience, and asked not to, not to put it on even because it offends the feelings of others. But here I feel um, comfortable enough. So this is a women's prayer shawl. It has the four mothers on all four corners. See, Sarah, Rifka, Rachel, and Leah. And on our other model, we have a southern model. It has a piece from the uh, so the song that it says, let me hear your voice because your voice is harmonious and let me see your visage because you're beautiful. That's what it says on our tanuta. So the first thing is tali. The second thing is tfila, to pray out loud. The third is tfili, to put on phylacteries. And the fourth is tola, praying from the, reading from the tola, from the holy scroll of the Torah. And uh, in 33 years of struggle, uh, these are our, our four strategic goals. We won three out of four. It is now legal for a woman to wear a talus. It would not happen if we weren't there. It is now legal to put on phylacteries and light menorahs, read from the uh, scroll in the form. It is legal to pray out loud. And the only thing left is that we're not allowed to bring the Torah so we could read from it. We're allowed to read from it, but we're not allowed to bring the object from which to read. Don't figure this is legally, makes absolutely no sense. We have. We are forbidden from bringing the object that we are allowed to read from. On the other side of the partition, a, 
Of course, men are allowed to read from the Torah, from our phylacteries, and there's nothing men do on the other side of the partition that bothers me. However, what I do is breaking the 13 regulations of the law of holy places. One cannot perform a religious act contrary to local custom, which offends the feelings of others. Anyone performing such an act should be guilty of a six is punished by six months imprisonment. That's why I have a criminal record. I keep breaking the 13th regulation because I think it's unconstitutional and unfair. What does it mean, anyone performing a religious act contrary to local custom? Who decides what's local custom? Which offends the feelings of others? Who decides whose feelings are offended and to what extent? So uh, the government of Israel, in its infinite wisdom, has come after three years of negotiation to a solution that every mother knows. We do it all the time at home. You go to your room, and you go to your room, right? So that's the cosmic solution. There will be two plazas right next to each other. One will be ultra-Orthodox, with a partition, with a rabbi deciding everything, with women falling off plastic chairs while they're trying to look at the garments by the men's section. Fun fact, every year between five to 10 women fall and break their neck. No, break their leg or limb, falling off plastic chair in a bar And there'll be another plaza right next to it. And that plaza will be run by us. And it will be egalitarian and equal and friendly. And we will compete in the world with the plazas and make the best plaza win. And I think we have a good chance of attracting most people, even Orthodox people. So that's the Kotel Agreement. Thank you very much. And it wasn't the Orthodox that blocked it. When the Kotel Agreement passed in December of 2016, 15 ministers voted for it and five voted against it. It passed. The problem when it was annulled in June 2017 was not the deal to Orthodox. It's that the seculars bow down to ultra-Orthodox terrorism. That's all. It's, it's the problem at the wall is not ultra-Orthodox. They're a minority. The problem is the weakness of our democratic secular leaders. Okay, thank you very much, um, Dr. Held. Uh, if we accept that the chief conflict of the city, at least over the last few centuries, has been between Muslims and Jews, um, what, what then is the primary interest of the major Christian sects in the world when it comes to Jerusalem? Well, of course, Jerusalem is, uh, is a holy place for all the Christians in the world. At least all those who believe in, in, the, uh, in the Bible and in the Word of God. And they want to be here. And what's more, there are guardians of the holy places for the last 2,000 years. It is the Orthodox uh, Christians. Uh, like the Greek Orthodox Patriarchate and uh, the Copts and the Armenians and uh, many of them. And, and they, they keep those places uh, for the rest of the world. And they keep the places very well, including the, uh, the Catholics, uh, that is the Franciscans. They have a wonderful ministry. And I think what they're doing is, is tremendous. They, they, they keep those holy places. They, they work together with Israel on a regular basis. And there is great understanding and great knowledge about each other. And the, the, the reference to Israel is constantly there. The, um, the, uh, the Franciscans, they have a great um, uh, media studio from where they report daily from, from Jerusalem into the world about Israel. And I think they do a very good job. And, uh, and if you go to the uh, evangelicals, they, they really they do a lot of work. Uh, they have a very great um, uh, cooperation with Israel, many, many, well, most of them, I would say. Uh, this is a group of people that is, numerically speaking, the biggest one amongst the Protestants. And, and they have their own studios, uh, TPN and many others, who are doing uh, great documentaries and, uh, and bring, the, bring Jerusalem uh, to the world. So they, they do very well. Uh, the Protestants in the old city, they are a minority. They are a dwindling minority, I would say. And, and they are dwindling. Uh, some people would claim it is because of Israel. I would say it's not what I observe. I've been here for the last 40 years, and I can see that, um, that Israel is tremendously um, helpful in, in many, many ways when it comes to 
uh, uh, renovation of, of houses when it comes to um, to make space for, for Christians, etc. I mean, uh, there's a great, uh, a great thing that is going on, and I just focus, I'm not about it. I think what the Protestant churches do to themselves is a disservice by uh, by actively working against Israel through BDS, or God by Western Central, and other activities against Israel, which does not meet um, the taste of the majority of the Protestant Christians in the world. So they stay away from those churches, and they go instead to uh, to those um, uh, Protestants uh, in, in Jerusalem that um, are mainly located in West Jerusalem, and, and these um, places of worship, they are growing, and uh, their numbers are really growing, and uh, they are rather influential, and, um, uh, and this is too um, sad for, for those uh, Protestant churches who once started in the 19th century, um, quite well off, but unfortunately they lost contact with the development of what is going on right now in, in the state of Israel. Very much. Um, so we have a few uh, pre-submitted questions from uh, journalists who couldn't quite make it today. Uh, so we'll ask those first, and then we'll open up questions to, to the audience. Um, Ms. Hoffman, you mentioned not being able to, to, to bring the Torah, to bring the, the books of prayer to, to the area in which you are praying. How does it have, and, and, some, and some people of your movement, if I'm not mistaken, have actually had to hide them in their bags. Uh, how does this make you feel in, in the Jewish state to have to hide Jewish books? Yeah. It's, it's, it misses the point. The idea of having a Jewish stock in the state was that there will be a supermarket of Jewish expressions here. That this would be the club mid for the Jewish soul, the Disneyland for the Jews. The fact that I'm forbidden from bringing a Torah scroll so I can provide a young girl who wishes to have a bat mitzvah to have her read from the Torah. It is such a, it's, if it wasn't sad, it would be really comic. And there are comic aspects to, to this uh, story. Maybe I can share with you one of them. Uh, years ago, I think it was in 91, I petitioned the Supreme Court and demanded that women of the world have 11 hours of, a, of prayer a year. Only once a month, and this is not including Tishrei, the first of the year. Uh, and may the minister of religion himself decide when it will be the one hour a month when we will be able to pray. It was a trap, yes? I got phone calls from America, how can you sell us out? We deserve 27 hours, 24 hours, seven days a week, you know, Americans, blah, blah, blah. I said, let's, one minute a month. Is revolution. Let's do one hour a month. Let's see what happens. And the minister was approached by the Supreme Court, and they asked him, "What do you think? These women are bending over backwards. They're saying one hour a month, and you decide when. Four fifteen in the morning, quarter to five in the morning. You know." And he said, "It's not that they dis they disturb the feelings of others. Now that's a bombshell. For fourteen years, starting, he kept saying that we disturb the feelings of." It's not that they disturb the feelings of others. They disturb the wall. The wall, as a minister, I know what the wall wants to see, and I know what the wall wants to hear, and it doesn't want to see them, and it doesn't want to hear them. Who was that minister of that? Suiza, and you know, from Shasta. It, craziness. It is a, it's not a theological struggle at all. It's about funding, it's about power, it's about anything, about resources. I've not, I'm, I don't think it's a theological argument in any way. I just have to say that um, having made Aliyah myself to Israel, not once did anyone sell Israel to me as a club bed for the Jews or, or Disneyland for the Jews. Um, but thank you for that. Rabbi Glick, similarly, you're forbidden from using your own prayer books on the Temple Mount, uh, and doing so is punishable by law. Uh, what does this feel like? Well, uh, first of all, I definitely think that people should be able to pray in, everywhere. And if the story that I'm not telling is telling sounds weird, then and that we're talking in a place which has no heritage, something that was made up in the last 50 years, nothing to do with the Jewish people, the Western world. And we're talking about the Temple Mount, which is the world center of the Bible for thousands of years. 
the place where Christianity began, where Jesus turned off the table and started Christianity. There, Christians who come from all over the world cannot carry the Bible. It tells the story. It's very, very disturbing. I'm not going to walk into the temple, to the Kotel with the, with the prayer book. She can walk into the Kotel with the, with, with, the, with the Torah book. She can't walk with a scroll. We cannot walk not with a prayer book, not with a Bible, printed Bible in our bag, not with a menorah, not with a, 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 a it's very weird. But we have definitely made a lot of progress in the fact that for many years, because of the fact that we're not allowing Jews or anybody who are Christian or who are not Muslim on Temple Mount, uh, for many years, people just didn't go there. And the change has been, has been that we've encouraged people to come. And the more people come, the more it's becoming peaceful and quiet. And today, uh, Jews can pray on Temple Mount. We pray on Temple Mount openly. Unfortunately, we, we cannot uh, carry any kind of uh, prayer book or any kind of uh, Torah scroll, but we, uh, we have our cell phones, and that has all the prayer in there. <laughs> so we pray on Temple Mount openly. Uh, every single day, but I'm still unfortunately Temple Mount is open for non-Muslims only four hours a day, five days a week. For Muslims it's open uh, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, but, but, but mainly the question is not but what you can bring a book, you can't bring a book. The question is how we refer to the place. The place which is holy to Jews, to Muslims, to Christians, to all believers in the Bible should be a place of peace, should be a place all people are, are supposed to be able to come there. And uh, if we came, and for some reason, for some accident, historical accident, uh, people have stopped and changed history and falsely turned the Western world into a holy place, which is nothing, no, 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 no historical facts to that, and have turned their back on the holy place, the only one holy place in the Bible, that's what's strange. So we're trying to, less to fight the government, and less to fight. We're trying to reach the hearts of mankind. We're trying to tell well, every tourist that comes to Israel, go to the Temple Mount. Every Jew who's here in Israel, go to the Temple Mount. And the more people who go to the Temple Mount, the more chance that it will be a peaceful place for everybody. The more people that will run away from it, uh, neglect it, that will leave place for the radical people who are searching to encourage violence in, in the city. But you know firsthand, of course. Uh, Anna, do you, do you have aspirations for the Temple Mount then, if uh, said wall is not uh, holy? Well, once the government of Israel, I hope, it, <coughs> once the government of Israel decides that Jews can pray openly at the Temple Mount, I would expect that women would be allowed the same rights. But right now, this is not the case. But I want to say something about prayer books. Just a few months ago, we went out a 39 of our prayer books were destroyed at the Kotel by a mob. Uh, 39 books torn to pieces. Uh, here's one of the pieces that we were able to salvage from just bending down and picking them up. Half a million, one of the two. Uh, I talked to some of the 150 police and ushers that were there because I had a very simple question. How come a mob destroyed that many prayer books at the Kote and not one person detained? One person having any consequences of this. And I was told that it wasn't seen as the hate crime that it was. If a Palestinian group would have torn up 39 prayer books, of course, they would identify it immediately as a hate crime. It was seen as a, an expression of religion. And that's a very sad comment about our town, in, about Jerusalem, that this can be seen as an expression of, uh, of, the, of, of the faith. And this is for you, Yuda, a friend and a colleague for many years. This is from the Talmud, the place that my heart holds dear, my feet will bring me near. I'm sharing with you a torn piece of my situ out of 39 prayer books that were destroyed on the 11th of June. Broken, no one was detained, no one paid for this. Let's hope for peace and equality. Amen. Okay. Thank you so much. This is very disturbing. People allow themselves to I have a video. You see the faces of the people who did it. It's so easy. 
you guys know there are more cameras there than anywhere. Not one person detained. So don't tell me about how safe it is to go to the prayer to the content, because I'm going to take one of this is one of the women in the world prayer books. I'm not sure I'm going to bring it back in, as, in one piece or as out of burnt, burnt ashes, as happened a few times, as you know. This is one of great achievements. Women from Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox synagogues were able to write one text. That took six years. Can we follow some questions? Uh, yeah, just one, yeah. for the, one question, uh, if it's okay for Dr. Helm. Um, should the Christian world stay out of these conflicts, whether it's between the Muslims and the Jews, or within the, Jew, the, the Jewish communities? Well, listen, I mean, the, the Christians are such a minority in Israel, we have two percent, and that's all. And uh, amongst us, we are quite divided. So uh, there are those who take stands with, uh, uh, with the Jewish people and, uh, and those who don't. I mean, this is not that, that there is one Christians. But what I would say is the following. Um, as Christians, um, and I've been here in this world for more than 40 years, I always felt, really just speaking, I really never ever saw anywhere a restriction in my worship, practice, or Etc. But um, also, when I look at, uh, at Muslims, they have religious freedom. They do what they want. They they go to the court, they go to the temple mount, they do uh, their prayers and whatnot and so on. So and, and they are also protected. It seems to me the only people who are not experiencing uh, religious freedom are Jews in this country. This is such a sad situation because. Um, what Yehuda says and uh, what Elad says, it's very, very true. And it's very extremely disturbing. And there, of course, the government is uh, trying, um, you know, to, to be very, very uh, silent about it and, and not to, to, to disturb anybody. And uh, as Elad said before, it is a bit of a, of a common situation, it seems. Uh, and also vis-a-vis the Muslims. And so, uh, there, sometimes it seems to me that Israel could be much more forceful vis-a-vis uh, -vis its own Jewish people. Thank you. Just before we open the floor for questions, it is important for me to make clear that there were immense efforts to bring uh, a speaker from the Muslim community to participate in this panel, uh, but those efforts uh, were fruitless. Uh, so just to put it out there. Uh, please, questions. I have, uh, shall I, um, Ask separately to each, uh, and I have questions to. How about we do one question at a time so we make sure that everyone okay, has okay, an opportunity? Okay, okay, Yes, of course. So, you know what, uh, Petra, I'd like to ask uh, you. When you say the only ones who do not enjoy freedom of worship uh, are the Jews, you refer to those two cases, different ones, of course, presented by Anand and Yehuda because of women on the province of the women on the wall, and um, the group of Jews who, like Yehuda, want to pray on the Temple Mount or think they should, it should be you know, openly free, you refer to that, or you see other problems regarding Jewish worship in, in Israel? I mean, these are two obvious cases which I refer to now, but I'm sure, um, and also I observe there are other cases in, in this respect as well. Like the uh, Hebrew they are not always very happy uh, with the Orthodox and the other way around as well. So there is a lot of, uh, uh, of, um, of discussions within the Israeli society going on with restrictions that the one type uh, puts against the other. Um, so I think this is not unusual. It's a very healthy situation. And healthy, of course, it is, uh, it's painful, but, but it is good that there is this kind of dis discussion going on. And you have the same thing in, in, the, in the Christian world. Uh, of course, it's not so obvious here on the table, but uh, Christian women uh, being uh, ordained ministers, they have uh, not the chance in the Orthodox world. And, and I'm ordained, an ordained woman uh, of my Protestant church, so I'm very happy and proud of it. <coughs> but, um, but I know exactly what the Orthodox, uh, what my place in the Orthodox Christian world is. It is not the, the place of worship. I mean, I can worship, but under the direction of men. But then, on the, on the other hand, I personally have learned, personally, I don't uh, say this for anybody else, it is, um, 
um, it doesn't matter to me today any longer very much who is leading a worship because um, I'm going there to worship. And uh, in my youth, I was really very strong feminist, etc. So, so I know exactly what it is to feel uh, to feel deprived of doing what you really want to do. But today, I, f I feel different. You know, I can do what I want to really do, and that is teaching and doing research. This is where I'm free to do, even with the Orthodox world, uh, the, the Christian Orthodox world. Um, not necessarily with the Jewish Orthodox world. When I say I study the Gemara, it's a bit of a uh, it's not right for the Christian, you know, but uh, not everybody would say that, but it's, there are those who do. So there are limitations constantly, and the question is how do I work with those limitations? But then I speak as a private person, and I'm not a patriarch, so the patriarch, of course, is to look after the, the well-being of many more people of this whole congregation, and, and there he has, like, the government of Israel to balance out many different viewpoints and, uh, and interests. So, um, I understand this, so uh, yeah. So we have. Uh, I observe. I observe those limitations in other parts of society as well. Thank you. Just a very small, concrete question, Petra. How you know? Sometimes we need labels. How should we present you uh, within the diversity in Christianity? Where are you? <laughs> uh, well, I'm a believing Christian. And uh, I'm a follower of Jesus, so that, that well, that's already. Well, that's not a question of diversity. That's already a label. <laughs> I'm a Protestant, and um, I don't know. I'm a Jerusalemite, and that means, as a Christian in Jerusalem, living for such a long time, you evaluate. You know, you, you pick out where where are there beautiful things, and there are many beautiful things in many many corners, and I try to integrate them into my life as much as I can. And, and it's also that I must say that Israelism is a very strong element in my way of life. So it all, I don't know how it fits together, and some people say, oh, well, I'm crazy. I understand this, but uh, that's my life, that's all I'm doing. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Itay, I'm a journalist with Plastics One J from Australia. Um, Dr. Ali Awal, um, who spoke for an hour before you came today, is a representative of the Elo, am I right? And he gave the sort of Palestinian perspective on the, the Temple Mount and Al-Aqsa, and he, he spoke a lot about distinguishing between Jewish prayer groups and visiting the, the Temple Mount as tourists. And he, he clarified they didn't have a problem visiting as a tourist, but prayer was something that he found particularly offensive. And he, he spoke about how, I guess, Palestinians in, in reality, only really exercise sovereignty in Al Aqsa. Like, there's no other place where they have sovereignty in Jerusalem, and so that sovereignty is very important for them to defend. Which is why they object so much to, to Jewish groups praying there. The question I want to ask is, and maybe I'll use a Hebrew word, kavana. Do you think kavana matters? As in, if someone goes to Halabait to pray with Israeli flags and sing nationalist songs, or even have <coughs> chants. Is that different to someone that goes to serve Hashem? And should Kavanah be a factor in deciding whether one can pray in a certain place? I'll just say intent would be the... Yeah, but it, like a more religious... religious. Okay. Yeah, like, yeah. The first of all, what you described about uh, the Palestinians uh, representing them as here is something that I, I, I never understand, I must say. Somebody else, if, if I'm bothering somebody for praying, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But the fact that I pray bothers you, that's something that, that, that in, my, in my religion is, is intolerable. How can the fact that I mean, I'm such a nice person on the but if you pray near me, oh my God, it's terrible. And, and that's something that, 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 that shows that there's a problem. Why does the fact that I pray bother somebody else's sovereignty? I, when I see Muslims praying on the Temple Mount, they're very happy, and I see it. And even share a lot of the prayers together. Just like when I see with Christians praying together, I just came back from a prayer uh, event in Dallas, Texas. It was a thousand people praying together, Jews, Christians. I go and visit mosques, and people are very complimented by the fact that I'm praying in their mosque. And uh, I don't understand, and I will never understand. People but say, if you came to the mosque, with a giant Israeli flag. And I, don't, I don't do with flags on the I know, so that's what I'm asking. But does does the Kavanaugh matter? No, the question is not Kavanaugh. The question is definitely the, the attitude you come. Look, when I drove back down, 
It's the roads in Dallas, Texas. And I saw today flags all over, gigantic flags of the United States and of the Ukraine. It gave me a great feeling. And I thought it was a, it was a means of uh, empathy, it was a means of, of, of identifying with somebody else. So a flag doesn't have to be something uh, which represents power. I think that the Temple Mount should be a place where people are not there to promote agendas. Not religious agendas, not national agendas, not political agendas. The Temple Mount should go on there humbly. I was not crazy when, when Sharon said, here I am, here I am, I have to show that I'm here. You don't go to a synagogue to show that you're there, to show somebody else. But to go humbly and pray, and I'm very excited when I see, I love listening to Christian prayer, I love listening to Muslim prayer, I love listening to, 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 to parade people who are excited about what they do. Why does it have to offend me if somebody else is, is praying? Now the question of sovereignty on the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount, according to Jewish law today in Israel, according to the State of Israel, the law of the State of Israel, is under the authority of the, of the Israeli government, with religious authority in the hands of the Muslims. Nobody's preventing anyone from praying there. Nobody's blocking anyone from praying there. But the person to say, in, in, in our Bible, there's a, there was one person like that. His name was Haman. Everybody was bowing down to him. But there's one person who's not bowing down to him, the whole world go crazy. What happened? Somebody's not praying your way. God is not exclusive. God is inclusive. He wants everybody to worship in their way. And so I don't, if somebody has a problem with somebody else praying, I think he has a problem. And, and I, I was interested in your thoughts on that question specifically as it relates to Halabai. Uh, first, I need the translation of the word Lehita Meng. I don't know how to say that. <laughs> to play it. Uh, play it naive. Yeah, play it naive. Okay, but you are ignoring Yuda that uh, with your lofty words about God and how God is inclusive, the settlers that you are part of their movement have an obsession with real estate. And a Palestinian walking in Jerusalem on the way to the Temple Mount, in every store you can see a postcard calendar, a model of the Temple Mount without the mosque on it. Here he is, the Holy Dash, just received a million and a half check from the Ministry of Education. The Holy Dash people there, knitting the clothing of the Kohanim that will come and you know, kill some uh, goats over there. So don't, so from the Palestinian perspective, which I don't represent, but I'm just walking with my eyes open, I can see that when you say, I, all I want to and I'm not looking after your real estate, and I'm not carrying any symbols, just your feet have done enough in this country for him to be a bit worried. I see many Palestinians who have a picture of a flag of Palestine all over Israel. So they can dream, and people can dream, and it's, 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 it's even legal, in, in a democratic country it's legal to dream. Sure. They're not and sorry. if anybody does anything that's illegal, it's one thing. But if a person has a dream, go ahead, dream. There's a difference between a minority under occupation that's dreaming and a sovereign state which actively supports Mahon HaMikdash, which is talking about removing the temple, and removing the mosque and putting uh, uh, the new temple there. There's a difference. You are a sovereign state and you are, it is threatening, I'm just saying, there's something around I don't, I don't, I don't know where we're with occupation, I haven't seen it yet, I'm looking for it. Then when I go to the, the hospital and I'm treated but by Arab doctors and by Jewish doctors, they go to the pharmacy, I see Jews and Arabs working together, I go to the hotels here, I see Jews and Arabs working together. I don't see anybody any occupation. I see, I go and do my uh, shopping in Beit Safafa, Beit people from Beit Safafa come and do shopping in, in, in the market. I, I, I walk down Jerusalem and I see all the time, all over, people living here together, walking together, enjoying, enjoying. The only thing I think is something, this, this is something, there are Jews that are afraid to go into Arab neighborhoods, of being danger. I don't see any, any Arabs who are afraid to walk around in Jewish neighborhoods. So the, 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 I don't know. I, I don't know what occupation you're, you're referring to. And if you're referring to to the Palestinian Authority today, unfortunately, the Palestinian Authority again, once again, Palestinians walk around all over all over Judea and Samaria. Jews are afraid to walk around freely in Palestinian Authority. Not only Jews, Christians in Bethlehem are afraid of the Palestinian Authority, who's closing down and, and persecuting Christians. In, in Bethlehem, the city where Jesus was born, 
Christians are being persecuted by the Palestinian authorities. You have to know clearly, Israel is allowing freedom of worship for everybody, and, and the Palestinians are, are offending Christians every single day in Bethlehem. And the Christian world is afraid to speak up about it. So I don't know what occupation. I know that, there, that there's freedom, that there's a Palestinian authority. I know, unfortunately, there hasn't been any election that any Palestinian authority for really over almost 20 years because they're afraid of, of the results. Because maybe they won't be re-elected. So there's no democracy. There's no freedom. There's no freedom for women. There's no freedom for, uh, for LGBTs, even for the Palestinian authority. So all that doesn't exist. And I don't know, they're all occupation, 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 occupation. No Israeli soldier steps his foot in any Palestinian city uh, on a daily basis. So this claim about occupation, occupation, therefore, since occupation, so if you pray on the Temple Mount, you're going to endanger the world. Jews praying on the Temple Mount don't endanger the world. But endanger the world is not prayer. What endangers the world is people who kill people, people who do terror attacks in the middle of their Sheva, Chadera, and Venebra. That's what endangers people. Prayer is not endangering them. I just want to touch, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would like to say that um, that you, that you were really right, that is that the Christians in, um, in Bethlehem, they, they are afraid. They don't speak up, and the only ones who really, from time to time, report what is going on is Christians in Bethlehem, and this really persecution, are uh, Israeli, uh, the Israeli press. I hardly ever see it in European uh, press media or in American media sometimes, but very rare. So it is that Christians are absolutely afraid, and, and you know, also I'm speaking about a very concrete case at the moment, we are not allowed to mention the name because he is in prison because he received the Yehuda in, in, uh, in this worship place. And uh, the worship is a hotel. <laughs> I died in a group of, Christ, of German tourists in a hotel yeah. in Bethlehem, and I took a picture with the owner of the hotel. The hotel is closed down. He's sitting in jail already for two months. And he, he sent this to the city in jail till the end of May because I guided a group of German tourists in his hotel. That's right. That's, that's, so that's this is a, this is a, but this is not only the only case in, uh, in in the Middle East. It is practically all over the case in all the uh, in all the uh, areas in the Middle East. <coughs> the Christians are persecuted and uh, and severely persecuted. And um, and it, it, I must say, looking at, at the whole big picture. And living in Israel, I'm so grateful because here it is really freedom of worship. That is what I receive, what, what I what I see, and I, I say it very honestly. Of course, there are some extremists who do this and that and so on. I personally, I never experienced this, but I know that some of my colleagues in the old city um, they experience spitting at them, etc., which is very very unfortunate. And uh, and we have um, worked, at my institute, we have worked quite a bit with the, one of the yeshiva, in the yeshiva that are right next to all the ornament of, uh, of, um, of Zion. And for a while it was better, and then um, the, the rabbi was exchanged for another one, and then it was, uh, again, that came up and being a problem. So, I mean, there are extremists like this, and, uh, and every society has such extremists, but to focus on them, and and to put a, a lens on it and say this is Israel is absolutely wrong. And this, my experience of 40 years is really, I never, never, ever experienced it. Honestly, I can say this. My husband is a Christian too. He also never experienced this. And um, and I can tell you of many, many other people who never experienced such things. Such, such things. We are the country. We have very close relationship with many, many um, Jewish quarters, Orthodox, ultra Orthodox, even in the Lake Park. We study together, even with uh, the rabbis in the Lake Park. And, and so there are honest and wonderful people all over the place. And I would like to focus on those more than on those who are really, really radical and, and unfortunate. And they are not and they are not like the Israel either. So it is not uh, representing the, the picture of Israel at all. You mentioned several times and others as well that, uh, that it, is, it isn't indicative of what's going on in the rest of the Middle East in terms of the right to uh, Christian freedom of worship. Do you think that the clergy needs to be more uh, verbal, more loud about about that? And we don't hear often about that issue. Well, they are afraid to speak about the issue of persecution in the Middle East because uh, many of those uh, 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 religious leaders who are living here in Israel they represent uh, their constituencies abroad in the Middle East, 
and many times uh, they are afraid if they speak up and for Israel in public that this will do harm to their the constituencies in Syria, in, uh, in Iran, in Iraq, uh, in, in Turkey even, or in Lebanon and other places. So that's why, that's why they keep silent. But we all know that silence is never ever a, a, good, uh, a good choice, like what you have said before. If you don't go to the Temple Mount, then there's free space for other people who use the space for their own um, atrocities or their own uh, evil thoughts. So the same uh, when, you, when, you speak, when you're not speaking about the, the, these uh, um, persecutions and, and the genocides that are going on in the Middle East against Christians, um, then this is uh, to, to the Christians' own um, predicament. And I remember a, a, a Syrian Orthodox source, Christian source of the 7th century, 700, uh, 680s, and there the source uh, of a Christian uh, writer says, um, since the um, uh, conquest, we are experiencing a, that a, um, a, a veil of silence is putting is being put over the whole world a veil of silence so we have it in the seventh century and we have it today so ever since we need we need to change our attitude and don't ask me how because as i said before i'm not a i'm not a politician and i'm not responsible for a big community but um, but what i can do is i would like to help to speak the truth when they see what is right and and what is just and this is what i would like to say Thank you. Uh, we have promised to finish on time, so last question. To you me. had a quick question. What's your response to to Jews who don't think Jews should go up to the Temple Mount on religious basis? I've heard you speak about this in public a little bit. But. First of all, I, my Jewish life, my Judaism is open-minded to accepting people who don't agree with me. And I trust from and respect and knowledge or respect them. I can tell you that throughout history, the best fruitfulness that we can receive in our world is by uh, disputes. I think the biggest contribution to the Hasidic world was the anti-Hasidic world. The best contribution to the feministic world was the anti-feministic world. The best books that were ever read, written about Zionism were those that came as, a, as, as an answer to those who were the anti-Zionism. So I think that this is what our, our Jewish life is all about. I strongly, I don't think they're right, I think they're wrong. I think they misinterpret the Torah, but I, I, to, I will give everything I can to allow them to speak up and, and to share their opinion, and I will show them why I think they're wrong, but we can only gain by these uh, disagreements, and uh, I think it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's definitely a legitimate opinion, and, uh, and they, they have a right, in a democratic country, people have a right to be wrong. <laughs> yes, a very brief question for you, I want to ask. Yehuda, beyond your deep conviction about uh, really the, the freedom of everybody to worship God the way they, they find it. Uh, it's God, not mine, but it was written in the Bible in the way yes. before I was born. But I mean, I know, that, I know that you're a man of peace, but you said explicitly that you and people who go with you to the Mount pray uh, openly in the Mount. That, we know, uh, let's say, a departure from the status quo. Uh, can you understand if Palestinians see, or the Muslims there, see in that provocation because it's a change in the status quo? What, 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 I don't know if that change in the status quo. That's been a situation for at least the last five years. Okay. When, who made, when is the status quo? What, I think that there's nothing, that, that I always say, there's nothing, everything related to the new status quo. Till the year 2000, Jews were allowed to pray on Temple Mount on, 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 on Shabbat also. Since 2003, they closed Temple Mount and Shrajud and Shabbat. Is that a change in status quo? There's nothing in a the dynamic world status quo. What does the word status quo mean? I, I never will understand what the word status quo. The whole idea of democracy is for me fighting for my rights legally and trying to promote change, make changes. I, I, I wore a different shirt yesterday. And my children are, were, were, were four years old 15 years ago. Now they're, they're, they're 19 years old. What can I do? The world changes. There's no such thing in a dynamic world as a thing called status quo. It's, it, 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 it's, it's something that, that, that I don't understand. Everything should be done publicly, openly, freely, respectfully. And, uh, and, and, there, and there's no status quo in Temple Mount. They, they opened the new mosque 
uh, on, the, on the gate, the gold, near the Golden Gate uh, two years ago. Good, I'm making people pray. And uh, change the status quo. I don't know what change the status quo. As long as people are doing it, they're not harming other people. It's wonderful. You know, there are Muslims with whom you are in contact. I don't yes, there, there are many. many you share your there, are, there are many. Unfortunately, every one of them is afraid for his life. They There's videos of praying with them. They beg to be able to pray with me also. They beg me, please, no, nobody should know their name. And that, and that most thing that, that what makes me most sad, that they're afraid to know the people that they're talking to. Because who, and who are they afraid of? They're afraid of the Palestinian Authority. Who are they afraid of? The religious leadership. I'll tell you the name of a person who I was in warm contact with for many years. His name is Mansour Abbas. Today he's a member of Tessa. But when he were, we were in contact, and I was in contact not only with him, with his leader, Narwish. We were very close to the close, but they always warned us. Nobody should know. Nobody should know. I think things are changing, and I'm happy that Mansour Abbas is today. A search for a solution, a formula that will try to solve the situation. What's the situation now? Because we, we know when Rivlin was president, what was his formula, that in principle, all with uh, Natal Sharansky, in principle accepted and frozen. What's the situation now regarding the search for a formula that we solve it or try to? So first, this government is uh, certainly received a blow today. Uh, to begin with, this government, you know, it reminds me that when the first platypus arrived in the at the end of the 18th century in London, the zoologists it's, couldn't believe that this was a real animal. They felt that someone in Australia connected a beak of a bird and the fur of a squirrel and tied together the, the tail of a fish. Touching all the families of the uh, zoological world, it couldn't really exist. It can't be that a mammal lays eggs, that has feathers, that acts like a fish, and the males, by the way, can sting like a snake. It just makes no sense. This government is a plan. It's, I don't understand how it exists. They wake up in the morning every day and they ask themselves, do I hate the Netanyahu more than I hate my government mates? And this morning, apparently, and now they're joking on bread, on bread crumbs because of the bread issue in the hospitals, of course, the religious issue. Um, What's going to happen with the Kotelin Agreement? We are trying to push, uh, of the seven parties that make the government, five said they want to implement the Kotelin Agreement, um, but the two parties that are against it are now falling apart. Uh, if you ask me, frankly, what will bring the immediate implementation of the Kotelin Agreement, it's a situation which I don't want to see. But it will be bloodshed at war. This destruction of the of the books, the fact that we are physically attacked every time we go, the fact that there is such immense incitement against us, we are seen as the reason for Corona. In fact, there is a table that someone published that shows that when we pray, the Corona goes up. When we go, we pray on Zoom, the time Corona went up. I have the table. Someone actually went and did this study with this much of incitement and zero interest to protect us, I'm reminding you, 150 ushers and soldiers and, and police saw the books being torn to pieces, not one person detained. The writing is on the wall, excuse the bad, the, the pun, the writing is on the wall. There will be bloodshed. There will be a Shira Banki, remember the girl that was murdered in the gay parade six years ago? There will be a, a, a woman of the wall who's a Shira Banki because that's what happens when there's great incitement and no interest is in security. The minute there is blood at the wall, they will implement the code of agreement. At this price, I don't want it. But if you're asking me what, in my opinion, would be the trigger, it will be that. Sure. Just uh, one you. final question for the resident of Australia, taking from your example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to, it really follows on from that. With, uh, and we love the flat, of course, and it makes perfect sense to us. <laughs> um, that's, our politics will make no sense to you at all. We once had a minister who resigned because he received a bottle of wine, and he didn't declare it. One bottle of wine, he resigned. Yeah, so, different, different world. Um, but what I wanted to ask is just with the Ditzilman, so we've had now 
Um, she, I don't know exactly why she resigned, but it's rumored it's about the Chametz on Pesach or the conversion or the Kotel or maybe all three of those religion state issues. Um, cumulative. Yeah, cumulative. Um, why do you think, and, and given everything that's going on now with the terror attacks in Ramadan, and you know, the fact that I have no idea how to explain to a people in Australia that a government is falling because someone ate bread. Like, I don't know how to write that story. Um, but what do you make of this, and what are your predictions of what will happen for, for both of you, or three of you, to, to this country politically with the and leaving the coalition? I'm a non-profit organization. <laughs> I cannot prophesize what will be. Uh, do you think she made the right decision? I don't know. Look, uh, I, I was very happy that there was a government, though, but I was very happy with the previous government as well. I liked when there are governments that are consisted of, of different fragments, mm -hmm. but I liked it on a wider government. Unfortunately, the fact that this government was exactly in 61, and the fact that the leader of the government was somebody of the party of six members, wasn't, didn't seem very promising from the beginning. I was very excited by the fact that different components put together a party, a government, just like the previous one. I was happy when Netanyahu and Gantz put together a government, and I was happy that Bennett and Lapid, that was wonderful that Lapid humbly stepped down and allowed Bennett to lead the government. But uh, it's, it, it's not, it's very fragile. I was hoping this government would come wider and therefore the stability. Our major problem, the problem in Israel in the past five years has been the stability. The fact that everybody's willing to sit with everybody except for him, and everybody's willing to do this except for him. And uh, that bothers me. I wish we could be able to learn to sit together and we, they, they, we could have had a government of 75, 85, and therefore, when, when you have a wider government, not every single person can decide that tomorrow this morning I wake up and the breakfast is not good for me, then we're going to let's, let's turn down the government. If my wife talk, didn't even talk nicely to me, then I'm not going to... I don't know for any human what, what, what was so great yesterday, which is so bad today, and, uh, and vice versa. So I, I wish there would be more stability and more inclusiveness, and we can have a wide, strong, government which is not on one side, which, is, which can have more, as many components as possible. Yeah. Uh, I love this idea, I'm also non-profit, and uh, <laughs> uh, there's a chance that maybe the uh, joint party list, the Bishmutefet, will join. If they will join, they will say this government, they're saying they will never do it, and mostly they will say the looks of us. <laughs> it's easier for, for Bennett to make peace between the Russians and the Ukrainians yeah. than to make peace with him between Mansour Abbas and Ahmed Tibi. So, uh, <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to say that uh, the vision of peace that comes out here several times is something that I really would like to share. I know Israel is, uh, is ready for peace, but in the meantime, we have to discuss a lot. And the peace comes at the end of time, so we are not there yet. In the meantime, I really, really hope, and this is my prayer, that Anad and your group can pray freely and openly at the cocktail, because it's only just and right in my mind, and that Yehuda can go to the Temple Mount and, play, and pray at the holiest uh, place of the, of the Jewish people, the Temple Mount. And, and so and I hope, from speaking from a Christian point of view, that um, different issue, but very important, that the hotel in um, uh, Jaffa Gate is going back to the Greek Orthodox Church. So if this all happens, then we will have peace and everybody will be happy. <laughs> I think on that note, we'll, we'll finish. We'll also wish uh, everybody a uh, happy Passover, happy Easter, and Ramadan Kareem, which all happens at once. That's I hope you enjoyed that briefing by the Jerusalem Press Club. If you did, like the video and hit the subscribe button to stay up to date with all of our future content.